Hi, I'm Michael. I'm an improv artist by night, pawn shop owner by day, mental health combatant, gadget lover, and as always, very, very neurotic. I'm also a TV host and your host for what we call the Second Scene Podcast. It is a Dweebs Global production where you can go for free mentorship help, anything from resume writing to mental health. Around the world, no catch, completely free, completely confidential, dweebsglobal.org. That's why we do this podcast. So and please like and subscribe and hit whatever button's in front of you right now. So today, I have the very funny Rosie Tran with me. Rosie has been doing stand-up for over 20 years. She has opened for some of the biggest names in the industry and around the world. Um, she's uh, one of the only uh, Vietnamese American female stand-up comedians and was pretty much the only one throughout the early 2000s. And amongst many other talents, she has also been a podcaster for some super interesting political and sexy podcasts. So welcome. Did that sum you up okay? Yeah. Hey, Michael. How are you? I am good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Although don't tell people I've been doing stand-up for 20 years because I don't look old enough, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, <laughs> I know. I wasn't sure I should mess with you. I was like, she's been doing it for forty-five plus years. Like, no, you do not look. You do not look as old as I do. So, <laughs> but I actually I can started when you. I was really young. So, yeah. How old were you when you started? Um, I got into the comedy scene in New Orleans when I was sixteen. Um, I was dating a guy who wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I actually was really shy. And yeah. um, he, I would go to him with go with him to his open mics, and I was always sitting in the back, like, "Oh my god, this is so boring." And he would say jokes a certain way, and I was like, "Why don't you say it like this? It might be funnier, or like try it like this." And I noticed that every single time he said it the way I told him to, he got a bigger <laughs> laugh. So that's how I got bitten by the comedy bug. And then after we broke up, I started to realize, "Hey, I kind of miss going to these like comedy clubs every day." So I was like, "Maybe I should try to stand up," and that's how the book was written. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. So did you do your first actual stand up after you broke up with him? You kind of went back on your own? I did. I, you know, I was like moping around um, and I was thinking, well, you know, one of my, you know, because I used to go out to comedy clubs every single night with him. We'd go to comedy clubs. I would sit in the back, you know, the miserable, you know, girlfriend with my arms crossed. Like, <laughs> when can we leave? This is horrible. And I didn't realize that comedy was actually soaking into my brain at that point. Um, <laughs> and so I was sitting at home by myself after we broke up and I was like, I kind of miss going to see stand up every night and going and and kind of like telling him how to tell his jokes. Right. So I started writing some material for myself. I was like, well, what would I talk about if I was performing? And so I wrote like five, three or five minutes. I went to an open mic and it wasn't a particularly like great first experience. It wasn't, you know, like people screaming and shouting and laughing. But I got up there and I found that I really enjoyed writing jokes and making them come to life on the stage so that was something that was really amazing I did have a really good first set which a lot of people don't and I was so shy Michael I was so shy but what I noticed is that for some reason when I went on stage my shyness went away so I felt like I was almost born to do stand-up uh, you hear that a lot and a lot of the a lot of the really good comedians I've met are like the open mics they get off stage and they're the quietest. They go back to the table by themselves. You just see them writing. They're not the ones drinking at the bar. Like it's the, that seems, uh, at least that's been my experience. I, I'm, I'm brand new to it. I've done like three shows. So my, my experience is very limited. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, a lot of comics are really shy. Yuri Seinfeld's shy. You know, a lot of people, it's like an alternate personality, right? Even a lot of performers are shy. Like Beyonce says she's really, really shy. And she has that alternate personality, Sasha Fierce, that she brings out on stage when she performs. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of like a, a a trope or like an incorrect trope that performers are like always performing and on and like these crazy wild people. A lot of the performers I've met are really shy and they just have this like alternate personality. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I used to have such stage fright. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'd be like out yeah. of body experience when I could speak in front of like seven people and I'd be like, <laughs> oh my God, the world's gonna end i'm gonna die up here <laughs> yeah the same thing with improv actors or actors in general you know robert de niro says he's shy and he doesn't like to watch his own movies so a lot of people it's like an outlet for them right yeah yeah he's almost too shy he's like the boring interview i always feel bad yeah. for the interviewers when he's on there <laughs> hard to get anything out of him <laughs> those stand-up nights though when you first start I mean, I don't, people that haven't been to them, they're, it's usually a bunch of comedians watching a bunch of comedians with maybe a couple of their friends there. And if you're new to it, you're shoved at the end. So you're watching comedy <laughs> for two plus hours before you even get up there and get to do yours. Yeah, I actually think that's kind of a toxic environment to first start because a lot of times the comics will only laugh at their buddies or they'll laugh at their type of humor. 
And so sometimes it's hard. I noticed when I was doing a lot of open mics when I first started, it was really hard for me to develop because they weren't, I don't want to say real people, but they were, they weren't civilians, right? They were comics. So what makes a comic laugh sometimes is a little bit different than what makes like the average person laugh because comics have such a high standard, right? Right. And like you said, they're friends. There was some, a group of guys that were getting up there and they were, they were high as a kite, each one of them, but they were <laughs> laughing their asses off at each other. Like they were the funniest things ever. And then I get up there with like a routine that I had done well with it, like uh, one of my class finales and man, it was silent. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah. So sometimes open mics are not the best place, place to own, um, hone your act. Um, I think coffee shops are great open mic nights that have musicians as well, because musicians have a different mind than comedians. So they're what I call like mixed open mic nights that have like poetry and, and um, also musicians, they, they have a little bit more well-rounded perspective, but open mics with just comedians, it can be brutal and you get a skewed perspective on what's funny because like I said, they're laughing at their buddies or they're laughing at what they find funny. And sometimes the thing is people don't understand comedy is like music. And people lump it all together. They're just like, comedy is comedy. No, comedy is like music. There's, you know, rock. Some people like soft rock. Some people like jazz. Some people like, you know, um, contemporary. So there's so many different types of music. And it's the same thing with comedy. Some comics are sarcastic. Some comics are physical comics. Some comics do comedy and magic. And, you know, as a society, we just lump it into one thing, comedy. But that's not really how it's, you know, how it is. And, you know, if you're a Christian rock fan, you're not going to go to a heavy metal concert and enjoy the show, right? Right. Right, right. No, very true. I mean, uh, Carrot Top is one of the most famous, successful comedians out there. And uh, the hardcore comedians will uh, tell you he's the worst guy ever because he uses Yeah, props, he would but... like bomb at an open mic, right? <laughs> right. Oh, my God. They would hate on him. They would hate on him. But man, he's been playing in Vegas now for, what, 20 years? He's like one of the most successful comics out there. It's crazy. Yeah. So everyone has a different style. Some people do one-liners. You know, some people do... So you have to find your audience. And I know comedians that have been wildly unsuccessful for years, and then they get on a show like America's Got Talent or, you know, whatever, where they can find their audience, where they get exposure. And all of a sudden, you know, they're like touring and have like a million followers. So you just, it's all about finding your audience. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, comics aren't the best judge of what your audience would be, right? <laughs> right. You're making me feel a little better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's true it's like the it, the analogy I always use is the one I just told you it's like you're not gonna get country fans you know or Christian rock fans to to be into metal and so if your style of stand-up is metal you know and it's it's just not gonna it's not gonna go well so I right. you know I've had shows where I bomb and I still have fun you know it's and like you know what they didn't care for me but I had fun on stage and I got to do my jokes and that's awesome and then I've done shows where like the audience totally like is my audience and they love me and they're like everything I say is hilarious and that's just the best feeling ever. Yes. So are you still doing stand-up now? I guess you're still. I am. I'm actually, time. it's been really tough with pandemic. Um, so I'm excited that live venues are opening back up because I'm really tired of doing Zoom stand-up, which is a little bit depressing as well. <laughs> <laughs> so hard. <laughs> so hard. You, I'm sure you love to feed on the crowd. I'm just that feeling of getting up there and hearing somebody laugh or watching somebody belly laugh is... It is. I love doing crowd work. I love, you know, talking to the audience. I love teasing people in the audience. I'm not one of those comics that picks on the audience, but I do like to talk to people and kind of make fun of what they say. I'm not, you know, I have an act. I'm not mostly improv on stage. I do have, you know, prepared jokes and stuff, but it is really fun to play with the audience sometimes. And, you know, when you're on a Zoom screen and you kind of like, it's like the person's blacked out or they have their image blacked out or you can't see who's laughing, you know, it's not as fun. And it's, it is a little depressing. So I'm excited. Yes about everything opening back up. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's so hard for all performers <laughs> through yeah. COVID. It's been, we've tried to adapt with, with Zoom and whatnot, but it is not the same. It's not the not same, same at all. <laughs> so you have been doing some podcasts and I was actually gonna jump right into one of the more risque ones because that's, sure. that, that's the stuff that gets me. Um, what do you have in common with adult porn star Tommy Crystal. <laughs> so you did you did a podcast with him and people don't know who he is. He's a director and a porn star and he's known for like his parody work, I guess. Like he's done like yes. Tavern, and Pee Wee Herman's Triple X and all these other ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um I have a friend who is a stand-up comedian and he used to work in the speaking of second acts, if you want to look for someone who's extremely interesting, he actually worked in the porn industry as his day job. Um, not as a performer, he was a producer, porn producer. And then at night he would do stand up. So he's one of my really good friends. And he kept saying, 
you got to do something with Tommy Pistol. You got to do something with Tommy Pistol. I was like, okay. So Tommy is an adult film actor. He's been in um, 300 plus adult films. Like you said, he does parody, but he's actually very comedic. So a lot of his films are parody films. He takes, you know, Star Wars or whatever, it makes a porn parody and they're pretty funny. And actually Tommy started off as an improv actor. Um, he was an improv actor on the East Coast and he moved out to Los Angeles. Um, somebody had told him that he should try being in the porn industry. I don't really know his origin, origin story, but mm -hmm. he, he somehow ended up in the adult film industry and it was his way of still being able to um, be funny and be an improv actor, I guess, and, and, and be in the entertainment industry. Okay. And so my friend kept telling me, he's like, you got to do something with Tommy Pistol. You got to do something with Tommy Pistol. I'm like, okay. So I, he's like, just meet him, just meet him. So we ended up meeting and I got along great with him. He was really funny, really interesting, but I was like, okay, what am I going to do that has to do with the adult film industry? Mm -hmm. So we came up with the idea of a special six episode podcast. Um, we were featured in Hustler. We were featured in, you know, other publications talking about what we were trying to do. And we came up with the name Dirty Change. And so what we wanted to do was I actually, as I mentioned, grew up really shy and I grew up in the complete opposite environment. Um, very conservative. My parents are immigrants. You know, we didn't talk about sex. We didn't talk about anything. And I, when I was growing up and dating, I had to learn everything on my own. You know, there was the internet was out, but it wasn't, you know, the way it is now where you could just Google everything. And so I really didn't know anything about sex. I was totally naive. I didn't know anything. And then Tommy knows like everything, right? <laughs> so he came up with the idea of a sex education podcast where he kind of would like answer my questions. We would have, you know, interesting, um, sexy or funny guests and talk about the industry, talk about sex and educate people, you know, like me in a fun, mm -hmm. safe way, not just like, you know, cause a lot of kids or a lot of people will Google stuff online and it's wrong or it's, you know, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Or they'll, they'll look at um, adult film and they'll think that's reality and not realize that it's a fantasy and not real. So it was, it was really fun. We did six episodes. We had different topics. We had questions. And actually, throughout the whole thing, we found out that we had a lot more in common than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what was one thing that surprised you? <laughs> um, so there was two things that were really crazy. Um, so Tommy actually was in a um, puppet adult film where he... Um, it was like a dirty puppet. <laughs> okay. and, and actually I shot a pilot with um, a Golden Globe nominated um, actor, Tom Sizemore in the 2000s, where I played a pornographic actress that had sex with a puppet. <laughs> 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 oh, I have to see that. <laughs> yeah. So it, it never got, it never got picked up. It was called mm -hmm. Pilo's house. The real, the real entourage. And, okay. the, and Pilo was a puppet and it was kind of um, like a crank yankers meets, um, you know, uh, entourage on HBO. And, okay. but it, the joke was that the, the main character was a puppet and it was a comedy, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the joke was that he wasn't a puppet. He actually got asbestos when he was a child and it turned him into a puppet, a uh, puppet like <laughs> person. So it was a really silly podcast. It was really fun. You know, I got to act with an Academy, uh, an, excuse me, a Golden Globe nominated actor mm -hmm. and a bunch of really funny improv actors. And, and I played a porn star. So one of the, the storylines with Pilo, the puppet, was that he had had a sex video. They were making fun of Kim Kardashian, right? So he had had a sex video. And so the sex video was called, um, I think, like Eight Inches of Felt or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, play, I played the porn star in it. And, you know, I didn't show anything. And it, it was just a scene of me, like, you know, fake having sex with this puppet. And then it turns out Tommy actually did a real porn with having sex with a puppet. <laughs> and so you know, shocker. That was like the, not something I would think I would ever have in common with no. anyone in my entire life. <laughs> but no. so, yeah, I, like I can, that, yeah, that, that's I usually can, a, a one and only uh, yeah. <laughs> situation, but yeah. So that was something we had in common. And then um, he had done a lot of like S and M porn and stuff like that. And um, this is another crazy story. So another mm -hmm. thing about this ex that got me into stand up. Um, when we broke up, we actually broke up. He cheated on me with a professional dominatrix. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, at least he went for something professional. <laughs> so um, I was 18 at the time, and I was, again, very naive. I had never done anything with anyone, and I had I was very just very sheltered. As I mentioned, came from a very sheltered life. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that maybe, he, you know, 
that there was something out there that I didn't know about and why did he leave me for this dominatrix? So I decided as an 18 year old girl, by the way, ladies, don't try this at home. It's very dangerous. I was like, I'm going to become a dominatrix and see what this is all about. So I actually became a professional dominatrix. I was a dominatrix for about two months uh, when I was 18 and I had no idea what I was doing. I went to an adult store and bought like a whip and like a sexy like pleather outfit and i just like again ladies don't try this at home it's very dangerous <laughs> i posted a dad on craigslist and i actually got a lot of clients i'm sure um, <laughs> uh, i didn't do anything sexual i just you know spanked them and like stepped on their face and stuff um and <laughs> michael you don't understand how hilarious this is because i really was an insanely shy very, yeah. very introverted person. But I was also an actress and a comedian. So I took it as an acting role. That's how I got through it. I was like, I I'm you. just going to take it as I'm being cast as the dominatrix. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I'm so lucky and blessed that nothing ever happened to me. I never got like kidnapped or like killed or, or raped or anything. So please, ladies, right. don't try this at home again. But it was definitely an experience. I got many, many clients, some very high end clients, including an executive of a very large, um, popular company. And I didn't know what I was doing. And, and two of my clients actually told me I was the best dominatrix they had ever hired in their lives. And I, I had never done it before, Michael. I literally was just just playing it by ear, improv. I was totally improv. Well, you, were, you were probably more original than anyone else because you were self-taught, <laughs> self-trained. <You were, laughs> it was your interpretation of what a dominatrix should be. <laughs> You know what I learned about? I learned that it's actually a lot of people think that dominatrix, because I did research online before I started, and a lot of people think that dominatrix is the dominant one. And actually, the dominatrix is very submissive because you're just doing what the person tells you to do. All I did was do what the person told me to do. They would say, hey, I want you to spank me. I want you to, you know, slap me. I want you to do this. So I, I didn't actually need any creativity. I just did whatever they told me to do. So right. it was, it was very interesting. And um, mostly just, yeah, beating guys with a whip and stepping on their face. I did not <laughs> get any pleasure from it other than an interesting story. Yes. And um, th uh, there was nothing sexual. A lot of the guys just really wanted to get the crap beat out of them. <laughs> I mean, I love that you did that. I think people should try to experience everything. You, you don't know. You might have ended up loving it. You don't know. But the experience I, of I not actually, knowing and, you know, yeah. I'm, sure, like, I'm sure there's parts of it you liked and you brought on to your, to your life moving forward. I actually and... felt so bad, Michael. I'm such a nice person. <laughs> I felt I got into it as a character, but I felt so bad. I was scared and I felt like I was hurting the guys. I was like, are you okay? <laughs> and they're like, more, more, beat me. <laughs> yeah, I've done a lot. I've never understood enjoying pain, but people do. Yeah. People really like the, <laughs> the pain aspect. So I don't think I got any insight into why my ex cheated on me. I think it was not unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a very fun and interesting story about that time I was the dominatrix for two months. <laughs> That's a great story. I love that. <laughs> I have. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, and me and Tommy Pistol had something in common. <laughs> that I like the things you guys have in common are hilarious. That's, <laughs> the, uh, the the ten inches of felt or whatever it was. Is <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So if my mom and dad are still listening, you might want to stop here because I'll tell oh, you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember I've had I've had one one instance with uh I was at a I used to hang out with my brother at gay clubs all the time. And I remember I used to always make him laugh and just like do silly things. And I remember just walking up to him once and I had a guy on a leash <laughs> just walking around with him and he had like the whole the whole zipper on his face and the whole dominatrix outfit. And it was, that, that was as close to the, the dominatrix world as I got. <laughs> <laughs> People get really into it. You know, I, I had one client who, who left me, he loved me, but he wanted, he was looking for someone to full-time dominate him, which I wasn't into. Mm -hmm. And he actually ended up finding a full-time dominatrix to control him. And he invited me over to the house to show me. And he was actually living in a full dog crate. He was living in a um, Great Dane crate and he just loved it. It was just the most bizarre thing to me I've ever seen. It was so, I, I remember at the club, this guy with like his, I guess his master came over to me. He was like, oh, he would like you to walk him around for a while. <laughs> I was like, okay. I, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to think I'm making fun of this lifestyle because I know that people that are into it are very serious about it. I'm not, but it just was so, um, I, I respect anyone's kink or sexual proclivities or whatever. But for me, it was just so funny that I was in that situation because I'm such a shy person and to be, you know, beating men, <laughs> slapping them around was just not my personality. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm with you, too. I'm not defending anyone. I love that everyone has different tastes and do their different things. Um, 
that's awesome though. That is so cool. The experiences that you've let yourself uh, get into that were so far out of your comfort zone. Yeah. I think more people need to do that, you know, go do something out of the box. It, it's, I think as long as you're not harming anyone or hurting anyone, then mm -hmm. everyone should explore everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, completely, completely. I could not agree more. Um, so going from that, you also, uh, did a couple other podcasts. Um, you did the Rosie and BJ save the world. Yeah. So that was really fun. So this happened. Um, it's been two years now we have season one up, which is I think 10 or 12 episodes. And so BJ is a good friend of mine. He is very far to the left and, um, I'm libertarian, which I believe is called considered far right. Um, just because it's more limited government. And so um, we, we just, we're really good friends and we talk about politics all the time. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is that, you know, people have gotten really divisive with politics. It's become um, angry, shouting at each other, people, you know, unfriending grandma on Facebook because she, you know, supported one candidate or the other. And I just noticed that that was also happening in my personal life. You know, I had friends and family who weren't talking due to political different opinions and, you know, getting into fights over political differences. And so what I wanted to do was, it was just a passion project. I didn't expect anyone to listen to it, but we've had a great you know, listenership, is I wanted to take two people with completely different points of view. He's a man, you know, he's Jewish, he's very liberal. Um, I'm a woman, I'm a minority, I'm Asian. I have more of a conservative viewpoint. And for us to talk about politics openly and talk about our point of views, and argue in a friendly way and not so angry and divisive and talk about our different points of view. And what I, I loved it. It was great. And what I loved is that we didn't fight at all. We were talking like civil adults and I, and that we had more in common than we had um, different. We actually agreed on almost all of the issues that we talked about. We talked about everything from immigration to, you know, economic policies, UBI, um, you know, sex work. We talked about any, everything and anything you could think of politically and our different opinions on it, open borders. And he gave his point of view and I gave mine. And what I, we discovered is that we had so much in common and it was just our ideas for how to fix the problem were different. And so I think that is what's going on. And so many people just get so attached to their political opinion that they can't listen to someone else. And so I was hoping to share our different points of view and have people know that you can talk to a different family member or um, relative or friend that has a different political view and still be friends and still respect each other and know that you probably have more in common than not. And that he gave, he gave me his point of view and I gave him mine. And so we were able to understand each other and maybe mo move more towards the center or move towards the other person's point of view um, and probably solve a problem or two. And so I hope someone, I hope a politician or someone that can make change listens to that podcast and knows that there is bipartisan answers to these very, very divisive problems. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with just how divisive people are at this point. And it's almost because yeah. they're, they're in their own little uh, protected bubbles and all they're hearing is their side. And then when they occasionally hear the other side, they don't even want to listen to it or don't even want to take it under consideration. Yeah, I think it's not just that, but a lot of the mainstream media and, and a lot of political pundits, they give their side, which is totally fine, but then it's an attack on the other side, right? So this is our point of view, but the other side, they're racist or idiots or, you know, libtards or whatever they call them, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, hey, our side is right. It's a tribalism, right? It's like red versus blue. So it's like our side is right and the other side, they're just idiots. And if they don't believe like us, then they're just complete, you know, racist and misogynist and they're sick and they're Christian Bible thumpers or whatever derogatory thing is said. And then people start to believe that stuff. But if you talk to someone in a calm way and you listen, you really listen, what we found is that we had the same beliefs. We had the same opinions. It was just what we thought was the answer was different. And so we all want to solve these problems, global warming and you know, overcrowded prisons and crime, we all have the same opinions about them, actually. It's just that, we, you know, one person thinks, hey, it's better to, you know, do more public funding for it. And another person thinks, hey, maybe we should do it this way. Or, and so it was amazing because we really, really agreed on almost everything. And I was really surprised by that because, you know, politically, we were on such opposite ends of the spectrum, but really we weren't. And I think a lot of people are like that. They just don't realize. 
It's true. It's true. I'm, I live in a very liberal area. Most of my friends here are very liberal. Then my business side of my life, I, I have some of my best friends now through the business side of my life. We get together a few times a year and they couldn't be more far right. Yeah, so it's been really, <laughs> that's how it usually is. <laughs> but it's really opened my mind. I, I think I think I've gone more center. You ask any of my far right, they'll tell you I'm far left. My far left, they'll tell you I'm starting to go too far right, you know, but <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's just, it's, having met them and become such good friends with them before we got into political talks really helped kind of I think both of us listen to each other and all of us listen to each other and, yeah. and it become more of a, a civil conversation and and not just calling each other crazy yeah and I think that this is something that's evolved for me I think 10 years ago if I would have had a political talk with someone um I was very liberal before but I changed my views after you know reading more and seeing certain things and I think I, you know, I remember I dated a guy that was very conservative and I was very liberal at the time. And I remember just being like, you know, you're just a racist, you're, you're, you know, closed minded. And I wasn't open to listening to what he had to say or his ideas. And I think that, you know, just seeing how horrible and negative the impact of that, I really, you know, changed my mind about things and said, you know, let me hear, you know, I, especially meeting someone who had a different point of view than me and was very intelligent. I was like, well, how could this intelligent person have this completely different point of view? You know, they don't seem like an idiot. And so talking to that person and respecting them already before we got into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's been great. It's I, I, I love that I can straddle the line where I think a lot of my friends on each side can't. <laughs> so yeah, it's so uh, sad. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So that's, that's great. That's an, uh, People should definitely listen to that podcast because people need to open their eyes, open their eyes and open their minds more and, and just allow the, the common courtesy of the, of the discourse and the conversation. Yeah. And not just that, but, you know, saying someone is an idiot really doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> no. And so we need to understand our fellow idiots so we can work <laughs> together and solve the problems. You know, fighting amongst ourselves is not going to solve global warming. It's not going to, we have so many problems right now, you know, in society and we need work and we need to move forward. We don't need to be tearing other people down. And, and it's, it's easier. It's easier to demonize someone and just say, well, they're an idiot and I'm smarter than them and they don't know what they're talking about. You know, and it gives you a little ego boost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the reality is that's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to make you feel smarter and better than the other person. It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. You're not going to win. There's no winning. It. There's, there's <laughs> exactly. No winning it's a lose-lose. It. <laughs> <laughs> so you also, you're also into cryptocurrency. Because you have another podcast called Hello uh, Crypto Kitty 2.0. Yeah, I have like 9,000 uh, podcasts. <laughs> yeah, you you have 9,000 lives, different, different. Uh, I guess nine lives like a kitty, but. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> so I so guess I you've done better than, you've done better than I have with cryptocurrency because I think I've only lost money. But. <laughs> I have, I got into crypto really early, but I still am very bullish of it and I believe in it. Um, I know a lot of people have lost money recently because the market's down, but I always tell people it's a long-term thing. Um, and one of my biggest points for crypto, regardless of what type of coins you're investing in or, or Bitcoin, or if you're doing an alternative currency, is I always tell this to everyone, the smartest people in the entire world, in Wall Street and in Silicon Valley are all pouring into the crypto markets. They're all, you know, the smartest developers in Silicon Valley, all of the projects in Silicon Valley that have the most hype, the most, you know, the smartest brains in the world from Harvard and MIT and Yale are all developing for different cryptocurrency projects. So even if you're not that smart, even if you're like, hey, I don't get crypto, I don't understand it, that speaks volumes. You know, when when people like, you know, Jack Dorsey of Twitter and, and um, you know, these, and even if you don't know anything about investing, it's like, you know, Wall Street, they want to make money. They don't want to lose money. Mm -hmm. All of the Wall Street, hedge, you know, there's hedge fund people from Goldman Sachs leaving million dollar bonus salaries to go work for crypto startups for free. So, you know, even if that is just information that tells you something that right. the crypto markets are going to be exploding in the next five to 10 years, you know, I just think it's an amazing technology. It's a, it's definitely uh, had a lot of negative press, but mm -hmm. if you go back and look, there's actually footage of Katie Couric and Bryant Gumbel on the Today Show talking bad about the internet, saying the exact same bad things about the internet when it first came out, saying, oh, it's, you know, it's bad, it's dangerous, it's whatever. Mm -hmm. And so anytime a new technology comes out, you have people coming out saying, hey, watch out, it's a scam, be careful. And I always say there are scams out there. So please, please be careful and try to do research and make sure legitimate people are attached to certain projects because there are people that are taking advantage of the crypto craze mm -hmm. and creating scam coins and things like that. 
but, and you know, a lot of people say, oh, this coin's only one penny or 0.001 penny. I'm going to, you know, don't put your life savings into anything. Um, but that's, that's the way I look at it. It's like when the smartest people in the entire world are all looking in an industry, the SEC had a um, unprecedented number of crypto uh, filings this year. They had over 300 um, legitimate companies that are saying they're going to expand into the crypto markets and they have to publicly disclose it with um, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So, I mean, this is just the very beginning. So just keep going, keep investing and keep doing your research because I think this is going to be a trillion dollar market. Yeah, it is. It is still just the beginning because there's it's still the baby. Out. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Um, I totally believe in crypto, so I'm with you with that. Even though I've lost money because I <laughs> short term, I, short know, term. Well, I'm losing money. I should sell it, and then I'm going to wait and buy it back after it goes back higher than when I sold it. And <laughs> <laughs> not a good investor. Um, <laughs> NFTs. Are you in the NFTs at all? Because that is one thing that I haven't fully grasped, and how people are making so much money on it. I don't know. Can you even describe NFTs for people that don't know what I'm talking about? I can. So an NFT is a non-fungible token. Right now, people are like making a lot of money with art, with NFTs. So NFTs is just a way to, it's like you can add a QR code and it's just a way to track um, the authenticity of something. So you could NFT music, you could NFT a comedy special. And so what I love most about NFTs is it's allowing small artists and small independent entertainers and small independent creators to monetize their work. So it's just showing that it's authentic. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So when you buy a piece of artwork, um, a lot of people think the value is in the artwork, right? So they're like, oh, well, um, the Mona Lisa is, is worth you know millions of dollars because Leonardo da Vinci painted it. And but if you think about the value of the actual artwork, there's no value to it. The Mona Lisa is a piece of canvas, which is cotton with some paint on it. You know, uh, if Leonardo da Vinci had not painted it, the, you know, the, the fair market value of the Mona Lisa would be like a dollar. You know, mm -hmm. it's like old canvas. There's no value to it. And so people have a hard time wrapping their idea around a lot of NFTs. It's just a JPEG. How can it be worth anything? And again, I say a lot of artwork, the only reason it has any value is because someone of value created that artwork. And so the value is not in the physical item. It's not in the canvas that the Mona Lisa is on. It's not on the paint because all of that, you know, you can go to Michael's or a paint store and buy it, you know, 10 bucks or whatever. Right. Or so, you can take a picture of it and then print it. It's going to look exactly the same, if not better. Than exactly. The original, exactly. Right? So the value comes in the creator of it. And so all it is, it's a digital representation, like a picture of the Mona Lisa, but it's authenticated. So, you know, say, Michael, you want to create a Michael NFT, you go on OpenSea or another platform, you create the NFT and you mint it and it has a little QR code or a little authentication that shows that you created it. Because again, the value comes from the person who created it, not the actual artwork. So that is um, basically what it is. It's just tracking that the authentic person created it and it has right. that lineage. And you can make money on it for the rest of your life. So the way that art works now is I, you know, um, own the Mona Lisa and I sell it off and I make my profit and then it goes on, right? And whoever owns it now makes a profit. But in an NFT, you can code in that um, wallet, that, that crypto wallet. So you make your Michael NFT and you sell it to me. Okay. But then I go off and I sell it. You can still make a percentage of that income because you are the original creator. And so when I sell it off to the next person, you would get like 10% or 5% or whatever you want to program into that. So for the rest of your entire life, you can make money off of that artwork. And you should, because it's your artwork. Right. Yeah, I think, I think it's a lot easier for Gen Z and young millennials to understand it because not because they're smarter than us or anything, but because they grew up on, in a digital world, you know, and people that when I, when I was growing up, I was still at AOL dial up, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, right. That little like weird. The, the modem. Yeah. No, the modem I, noise. I remember Yeah, I spent my high school years on a computer program. Like I was programming, but nobody else even knew what a computer was at that point. I was just kind of a, a dork in my, in my bedroom with the door shut. <laughs> exactly. So we, we were like the beginning of it. And so these kids, they spend their entire life online. It's not when they talk about digital items or digital assets or digital that's like second nature to them. You know, most, most of the kids I see, they have their head glued to an iPad. So it's not, it's, it's not unfathomable. 
Well, very fascinating. This uh, We covered a lot of bases today. I appreciate the openness and the sharing today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been fun. So uh, Rosie, Rosie Tran. Yes, my website is rosytran.com. I'm on Twitter at Funny Rosie and Instagram at Out of the Box Rosie, which is the name of my podcast, Out of the Box Podcast. Awesome. And she is very funny. I watched her stand up. You are very funny. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Michael. Yes. So thanks for being on here. Again, this has been a Dweebs Global production where you can get free mentorship help. Anything from resume writing to mental health. It's completely confidential, completely free. And uh, there's no catch. Dweebsglobal.org. Subscribe, like. See you all next week. Thank you.